Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Duma and I'm the principal of the Al Mustafa Academy and Humanitarian Society here in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm very happy and proud to welcome this afternoon to Al Mustafa Academy uh, Sisters Khadija, uh, Sisters Aisha, and Sister Fatima. And uh, they are joining us uh, this afternoon uh, to talk about a very special uh, event coming up at Al Mustafa School this uh, coming Wednesday, and that is Orange Shirt Day. Uh, but uh, first off, we will uh, read a declaration. We will say that we acknowledge that we are on traditional territories in Alberta of the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Jazakumullah khair for joining us in this discussion today. So inshallah, this afternoon we are going to have a wonderful discussion and uh, share some insight into Orange Shirt Day. Uh, sisters Khatija, Aisha and Fatima, welcome to the Al Mustafa School. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure having you this afternoon. Uh, first off, uh, if you don't mind, please just uh, introducing yourself and uh, telling us something about your First Nations background, please. Okay. Um, Salam alaikum. I am, uh, my name is Roberta Watney. I'm from Red Pheasant, Saskatchewan. And I, um, I've been Muslim for 11, 11 and a half years, and I li I've lived in Alberta about half, a long time, more than half my life, I used, used to say that, but that's changed. Um, and You're in Alberta. Yes, yes I am, for sure. <laughs> and yeah, that's, I think that's it. Jazakumullah khair, thank you for sharing. Sister Fatima. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Sister Fatima, Fatima al Bakali. I'm from the Samson Cree Nation in Muscochese, Alberta. And I'm Treaty Six um, Cree Native. Mashallah. Um, yes. <laughs> Jazakumullah khair. Thank you. And uh, Sister Aisha, also Sister Chelsea. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm Aisha. I'm from Little Pine First Nation, Saskatchewan. I've been Muslim for four and a half years and I've lived in Edmonton around 16 years off and on. Mashallah, and you're also with the Cree Nation as well? Yeah, I'm with the Cree Nation, yeah. Mashallah. So sisters, uh, thank you very much for uh, introducing us to, to your communities. So um, my first question is, what are some of the best memories you have growing up uh, in, your, in your communities? And share with us. For me, it was um, it was actually my school. I was a little girl um, going to the Christmas concerts with my my mom. Getting every, every year, my mom not like my mom always made us feel special. Oh, sure. Curled our hair, you know, and got us the prettiest dress and stuff like that. So I remember going to the Christmas concerts. And I remember you know her actually doing my hair. I still remember. Her fixing my hair and putting on, you know, getting her dresses, so things like that, and us singing or whatever at the Christmas concerts. And then on the reserve, we'd go to community events that have um, different, like, little dances or raffles, like uh, family oriented, and things like that that were always nice to to go to. So it was something we'd always look forward to. Would, it, would these be like, uh, like powwow events or, mm, or anything no, like that? No, it was more of like. I would think a little bit of fundraising, but okay. I mean, a little bit of, I know there was some music and things like that, so, uh, you know, there was food there and stuff like that. So that's what we, I look forward to as a, as a kid. Mashallah. Um, yeah, I was, um, I would attend powwows, and those are some of my good memories. I, um, we would go to Powell's every year. We had a, a food truck uh, concession, and we would sell um, burgers, fries, and just different kinds of uh, food. And actually, um, I would dance in the Powell's. Uh, it's called jingle dress style. Mm -hmm. yes. um, not, not just, just a little, a little bit. Like I didn't do it too much. Um, but I remember being there with the family and going every weekend to a different, um, a different reserve, and um, it was just lots of fun. We would run around. The, it's, um, it's in a circle, so we run around the whole um, circle. And also, um, school. 
on the reserve was different from school than school in the city. Um, I remember school on the reserve, it was um, memorable because uh, this was grade, grade one. We would brush our teeth in school. Our teacher, we would have a sink and we would have to our own toothbrushes, toothpaste, and we would have breakfast, and then we would brush our teeth at the school um, and use the sink, and we would also have prayer every morning on the intercom, and the prayer was in the Cree language. And um, if you were, different grades were cho chosen every day, so if you were, um, if you knew the Cree prayer, then you would get chosen to do it on the intercom for the whole school. And all the boys and girls in that school, were they all uh, of the Cree Nation? Um, yes, it was on the reserve. So okay. there might have been um, a few that the teacher's children might have been uh, of a different race, but uh, pre predominantly um, First Nations. So did you, uh, growing up in that school with all of the boys and girls being of the Cree Nation, did you miss interacting with other Canadian children? Um, at the time, um, like I guess being in the school, yes and no, because um, as well as being in school, my mom uh, enrolled me and my sister in dance classes in the city, so we used to um, interact with uh, non-First Nations kids through dance. So we had a good mixture of both, and we, um, we moved around a lot, so we, we, we did live in cities too, and we, we did experience the um, schools in the cities. Oh, mashallah. Jazakumullah, thank you very much, and uh, I'm quite sure you had some wonderful memories with the, the powwows. Mm -hmm. Mashallah. Yeah. Um, Sister Anisha, what, uh, what are some of your wonderful memories growing up in the community? Uh, growing up, um, my grandparents, my father's parents were very traditional. Um, they held a sweats. It's like a ceremony for our native people. Uh, I went to round dances like like I would go to uh, different reserves for round dances almost like all the time. What, what is a round dance if you don't mind? A round dance is where we uh, hold hands together and we dance in a circle and there's drummers in the middle. And Mashallah, were you a drummer? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's mostly men who drum. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. Mashallah, very good. Yeah. Anybody could dance. Um, you know, you sit there and uh, if you want to dance, you can get up and dance and yeah, it was, it was good and they would usually go on till like four in the morning and <laughs> like they That's would, a big, that's a long party. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They would bring us snacks and stuff oh, yeah, and yeah. like us kids would usually fall asleep on the chairs and like we would go back home in the big power van. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah, Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for sharing. I see a big smile on your face, so that is definitely a very fond memory from uh, from the days gone by. Mashallah. If I could just uh, add to that, sure. um, because it was a uh, cultural um, dance, it was looked down upon. Like even though it went till um, early morning or late night, um, it was looked down upon for somebody for people to bring alcohol there, or to be drinking there, and uh, or to be not in the good state of mind. Um, although people would still do it because it was it was like a party to them, but it was looked down upon, and also with the um, the men drumming in the middle and singing, um, the women do do sing with the men, but they kind of just stand on the other behind the men and they can sing with them. So what you're saying is it's a very uh, it's it, although it's you know dancing and drumming, but it's also a very serious uh, cultural thing. So there was a lot of respect that had to be shown. Yeah, yes. I have that. Well, thank you very much. So, sisters, what, what, would you, what would you say were the important lessons you learned from, you know, living in the community and from your elders? What were those important lessons that inspire you to this day, inshallah? Well, I, I have to say something. Like, my mom, um, she passed away, like, about 12, 13, 13 years ago-ish. And 
I didn't listen to her. She wanted to, me to make a bag. Several times she would come to me and she'd say, you need to learn, and I'd say, now, Bannock is a special kind of bread yeah. that uh, Coast Ranch is Yeah, yeah, make, right? it's, uh, yeah, it's, for me, it's, I've never learned to make it, and she would always call me, she said, come over, Roberta, come over, um, learn how to make the bannock, I'll show you, and she would start, and I'd be like, mm -hmm. I never paid attention, and, I'd, and she'd say, you need to learn, and I'd say, why, you'll do it, you'll do it for me, <laughs> but anyways, I never did learn, my younger sister learned, and I do regret that. Um, she, like I said, she passed away. I think it was 13 years ago. And um, your mom did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So these are one of the lessons I should have learned, and I could have learned. But as as a kid, you don't, you know, you don't realize the importance of people and things. So do you know how to make bannock now? I do not. Oh. <laughs> my, my daughter knows how to make bannock, and my, I think the other ones, everybody except me, knows how to make bannock. So I wish I would have listened as a kid growing up. So boys and girls, it's important to listen to yes. your elders. I guess it's the important lesson there, mashallah. Yeah. Sister Fatima, any uh, important lesson? The question again? Yeah, so the question is, uh, so what were, you know, uh, the, the important lessons that you learned, you know, from your elders and from your community and growing up in the community and participating in um, the community? So what I've learned from the elders, um, there's, there's, good elders, and I don't want to say bad elders, but there's good elders that are more traditional, and um, there's other elders who have a different um, perspective on things. So um, I've, like from the good elders that, I, that I've learned from, I learned that to always be kind to everybody and accept everybody for who they are. Um, me, being a Muslim, I've uh, come across some elders that they don't res respect me because um, because I'm different or because, uh, as they would say, like I left my culture. But the one the elders that are very respectful and that I look up to, they accept everybody, um, no matter, no matter who your background and um, your lifestyle. It could be like religious or um, the or not believing in a creator at all, or practicing mm -hmm. at all. So I think kindness and uh, respect for everybody is what, what lessons I would take. And, and that is uh, a universal value, mm -hmm. you know, that all, all people share, and uh, quite sure the First Nations people emphasize that as well. Um, Sister Aisha, any important lessons, uh, experiences that you remember from growing up? Uh, actually, yes. Um, growing up a lot, like uh, my family was very like traditional. Um, when usually when they would say when a uh, woman in our culture, when uh, we would get our um, like our time of the month, we would have to uh, be away from men in the house. Um, when I, we call it becoming a woman. When I became a woman, I had to stay in a room. I had to learn how to sew. Um, I, I had no idea how to sew. Mm -hmm. I was sad watching the other kids play, but I had to learn. I had to learn how to make duck soup. I had yes. to learn um, how to make bannock. And you know, like a lot of those lessons, um, I mean, I kind of went off the path a little bit, but like, um, you know, I still took those lessons now as um, an adult, like with the sewing and the bannock making and the beading and all of those stuff that we so, do. So, so Sasha, would you say that you know a lot of the traditional skills uh, of your people? Do you, you know a lot of like, the sewing uh, and the different yeah, know. And cooking and all that? Yeah, I know quite a lot actually, yeah, um, like, uh, but like Fatima said um, earlier, uh, when I became a Muslim, um, I mean, not, not all my family was 100% supportive, mm -hmm. but um, there was most of my family who did have respect for me and they did still, um, treat me as they did before I was a Muslim. Um, 
So I was really like thankful for that. And um, I just like, yeah, I just, I still feel proud to be a native. I still feel uh, happy that I have uh, like Aboriginal roots and stuff and yeah, I'm still very proud of my people. MashaAllah, and of course as Muslims we are always proud of whatever our you know, uh, background is or culture and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us of different nations and tribes so that we may know one another as, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. Um, one of the one of the um, you know wonderful qualities that people know about First Nations is your respect for the land and you know living off the land. Uh, and so, if you know if you'd like to share with us, what are your experiences with that? You know, living off the land and and uh, you know the lessons about um, you know keeping the land good and pure. Um, for me, I. I Mostly what I remember is growing up is my brother's um, hunting deer and oh, wildlife for, right. for, for our, to eat, not right. to waste, right? So that, right. that's one of my biggest uh, memories is just having that for, you know, to live off of because... Did you join them on the hunt? No, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> I was always, uh, I was always babied too much, by, I think, by my mom, so I was... But did girls go hunting just uh, in general? Not, not, not really. No, they're the ones that are supposed to clean the, you know, skin the animals. Um, but my okay. brothers always did it. My mom cooked. cooked. Okay, I shall. Yeah. So, Sister Fatima, did uh, any ex uh, memories of uh, living off the land? Um, well, uh, as I mentioned before, we used to go to powwows, and at the powwows, um, we we actually stay on the powwow ground so like I said there was a circle and that's where the people dance in and around the circle there are the concessions with all the food um, and then behind the concessions are the people who um, who dance and they stay in tents or s some teepees few teepees and or trailers so we had to um, it was kind of like a weekend of camping every weekend and um, so we we had to like conserve our water. We had to find places to shower. Um, if we were lucky, we know somebody from that reserve, and we can go to their their house and and uh, shower at their house. But um, other than that, I didn't learn too much about like cultural teachings about living off the land. But my my grandfather who passed away um, this year, he. He was uh, a medicine man. He would pick um, herbs from people's gardens um, with permission, and he would um, he would make tea out of them. And these um, herbs are special um, herbs that are going to help you with that illness that you have. And um, he would hand pick them um, particular to that illness. So and a medicine man is a very important person mm -hmm. in the community, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. And I didn't know um, much about that until um, until his final months, and I wanted to learn more, but unfortunately, um, I I couldn't learn anything, and that and that's um, um, sadly something that kind of died with him in our family because my dad didn't learn it, and my uncles, my auntie, they didn't learn. Um, they didn't learn any of that from him, so... So, Sister Aisha, I'll ask you the same question. If you have any memories of, uh, you know, living off the land and going hunting and all of that. And then I guess I will ask uh, all of us the question, all of you the question. Um, is there a fear that a lot of the traditions uh, and, you know, things like what your grandpa did with, as a medicine man, that those are sort of going away because, you know, they're dying off? and nobody's passing on that tradition. So, Sister Aisha first, I'm sorry, Sister Aisha, yes. Uh, uh, firstly, any memories of living off the land? And I guess maybe you'd be the first to answer. Is there a fear that some of those traditions and skills are getting lost? Well, I guess, um, like, growing up, like, uh, my, my grandparents, they went, like, uh, it's called a, uh, Weed grass. Mm -hmm. um, they they burn it and they pray with it in the native culture. Um, my grandparents 
like used to go sweet grass picking. Um, they used to go pick sage. They um, they would make like a muskeg tea. It's called. Um, it was like to help you um, when you were like sick. Like my kukum. Um, Kuka means grandmother Grandma, in yeah. Cree. Um, she used to give it to us kids when we were like sick, and they used to use a lot of like a natural kind of medicine with us growing up. And um, yeah, like I, I ate like a lot of um, different like wild game, mm -hmm. a lot of rabbit soup and stuff like that. So. Sounds yummy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so again, um, the, the the question that I posed earlier, any of you can answer. Um, you know, is there a concern or a fear that a lot of these traditional skills are going away because uh, not being passed on? Uh, for sure, like a lot of um, I know this old man used to come. The, my uncle used to pick him up and bring him to our house for that purpose. Uh, his, I don't know how to, what his name me, meant, or if I'm saying it right, but it's Winchaku, I don't know, Winchaku, I don't know. It's some Cree name, I don't know what it means. He was very old and he had a very good memory. And so they would always bring him to the house so he could just talk about, you know, I guess to pass along traditions and, and let people know, I guess, how life was, just a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. um, my my mom's dad was also the same because he both of these men live I live to be a hundred or more, sure so they know. would give us all you know all the stories and and right. that's how a lot of it is passed on a lot of knowledge is passed on through that. Other than that, if there's nobody passing that knowledge on, it will be lost, and and that is happening a lot because it's a lot to know and it's you know people aren't here to tell us anymore. And so people need to take an interest, like we need to take an interest um, in what they're saying because if we don't, everything will be lost. Um, yeah, like the lang language is lost. I never did learn my language. Right. Uh, my dad still speaks, of course, his language, Cree. The language is what you identify with, so if yeah. that goes away, that's a, that's yeah. a really big thing. Right? There's, there's many things that I don't know, and, and a big thing is the language, is, and none of us was taught the language because they, uh, it was bad when they went off the reserve to go to live, to communicate, to go to school. They were all scolded for knowing their, speaking their language, so, so we so, were never taught. So they were punished for speaking their own language? Yes. And that's why they refuse to teach any of their children. So now we feel, we yeah, we don't know our language and we feel... How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the fact that your, your elders, your, grand, your family, your grandparents, they were, they were shamed into not knowing yeah. their language or speaking their language. And as a result of that, you don't know the language, and then maybe even your children and maybe yeah. even your grandchildren, they will not know the language. Well, How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, the language is going to be totally lost, because right. if I don't know it, and my dad's gone, and my kids don't know it, you know, it's just, it's not good. And I feel, I, for lack of a better word, I feel ripped off, because okay. yeah. so many people, and Canada's multicultural, so right. everybody knows their language, so they know English and their own language, you know, mm -hmm. usually. And I don't know, I don't, I know English, and I wish that I could understand my own people talking. I wish mm -hmm. I could go get a job with my people that, that requires right. that no, knowledge of that language. I don't know. So I feel very um, upset that, I, you know, I could never have that opportunity to learn, mm -hmm. to learn what, what is mine. So, um, and one of the reasons we are sitting here today is because, of course, at the end of this month, we are observing Orange Shirt Day. And Orange Shirt Day was, as we know, the famous story, you know, of uh, a, a child being made to feel ashamed uh, of who she was. Uh, so w what does Orange Shirt Day mean to you as, as people coming from First Nations community? And as you mentioned, you know, I've had some bad experiences, like being made ashamed of your language and and the traditions being lost. So what does Orange Shirt Day mean for you, sisters? Well, um, for me, uh, I didn't actually know about it um, until I would say like four years ago. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what year they started. It was 2013. Yes. Yeah, so about four years ago. Um, 
and once my children started school um, they kept talking about this orange shirt day so I read about it and like I think that it's very important to our people um, it's very very important to recognize what the Aboriginal people have gone through the hardships that we faced the trauma that our elders have gone through and they some of it has been carried down to their children their children um, the intergenerational trauma um, so I really think that it's an important um, day that like everybody recognizes um, so we can remember a lot of the things that um, we lost as Native people, but at the same time, we can remember the strengths mm -hmm. that we've gone through, and yeah. Did um, either any, yourselves or did anyone in your family uh, attend residential school? And if so, what was your experience and what was their experience? What were their experiences like? My grandfather attended residential school and um, I think my mom can more, have more to say about that. You know, he didn't go over for very long. He he was there like a few days and he ran away. He was just, I, I don't and know. And he ran away because it yeah. probably was not a very nice experience. Yeah, yeah. He, they, they didn't treat him well. But from what I, I've read, you know, throughout my time is, um, yeah, they were sent to the schools, ripped from their mom and dad's, you know, arms. and Which is why he didn't like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so they if they wouldn't... Uh, if they wouldn't uh, allow their kids to go, they, they were put in jail. The families were starved because in those days uh, they had the po they were kept on a reserve, not allowed to go off unless they had a license or permit. And then, so on the reserves there was no stores, no food. So they were um, threatened if they're not going to send their kids to school. They were. Um, People who brought in the food were not allowed to give them any, so they had to. And they were they were made to sign the treaties that way. Basically, they were mm -hmm. given rations, and if they didn't comply with what they were told to do, and they were be, starved. And that and that would include sending their children to residential yes. schools. So if they did not agree to do that, yeah. they would not get any food. Yeah, yeah. And um, there was other there was other uh, punishments, and and one would be also going to jail. So there was different things that were. They were everything was used as a, as a weapon against them to so to get the kids out. So as you say, they were like forced to go. They didn't have a choice. I mean, yeah. they wouldn't go. They would literally get no food, and and, and then the police would come after them and all yes. of that. Yeah, they were being victims. So that was a lot of pressure. No yeah. Doubt. So and, so and and part of the reason they were told they were wanted on the resident wanted away. They were wanted away from their parents because they, want, they wanted the Indian out of them. They wanted right. the parents not to have any influence on them because they wanted to make these, these the next generation normal or not so. So, like, like you say, they wanted to take the Indian out of yes. them, meaning they didn't want them to have any First Nations identity, yeah. not the language, not the way they dressed, yeah. or certainly the, how they lived or anything. They wanted to, they were trying to make them into what? To, uh, they wanted them to conform to, to I guess, white or European society. Right. Um, so uh, traditionally they had long hair, like even right. the boys, they had the long braids. And so everybody's hair was cut, like cut, mm -hmm. cut right off. So their traditional clothes were taken, their hair was cut, uh, just many things. They were, um, they were hosed down with water oh, wow. and different stuff for the, for, they were treated all as they had lice, I think, and so they had all these chemicals put on them. Like just, they were just, uh, it was abuse. Yeah. It was also because of religion, they wanted them to become Christian. I see. So there was not just the school, but also to convert them, yeah. take them away from the religion of their, their forefathers. Uh, and th this this is what she was just about talking about earlier, is I don't know, it was, it was she said that um, when the elders say that you're, you're worried about your culture, you abandon your culture, mm -hmm. but we didn't abandon it. Like, they never cared before when we were, we were, like, we were, I grew up Anglican, so nobody ever told me, ever, that I abandoned my culture. 
until we became Muslim, and then all of a sudden we abandoned it. A little bit distorted how, you know, right. the, the thought, the thinking. Yeah, yeah it was nice. very, uh, um, even for my grandparents, um, it was uh, very hard. They went through a lot of uh, hardships in uh, residential school. My mother was in residential school. Uh, my father wasn't, but he was in the day school, and the day school um, also had a lot of abuse in it as well. Um, like Roberto was saying, um, Sister Khadija, uh, she was saying that um, they put um, stuff in their hair for lice. It was um, actually DDT they would put in their hair. Which is a poison. Yes, and like it was like really, really horrible things, horrific things that they went through. Like it's 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 still tough. So very painful memories, like even up to today. Yes, very painful. I wasn't in residential school myself, but I was in the system too. Like I grew up in foster homes too because of the intergenerational trauma. Right. Um, and you know it's like. It's very hard because a lot of our native community goes through that mm -hmm. a lot still to this day, and you know we. I think we should just come together as a community. Right. Uh, we've learned a lot of things today, so I would ask your sisters. You know, how can people, you know, who are non-native, uh, whether it's from the Muslim community or any other community? How can they become more aware and informed about the history and the culture of your people? I think they need to, everything is education, so I think they need to educate themselves first. Um, don't listen to what you hear on the street or don't listen to what you hear from there because I've, I've heard a lot, like in, in the city here in Edmonton, that um, immigrants come over and you know they don't, they don't know what First Nations are, they don't know what natives are. Mm -hmm. But they either they're either told quickly, you know, all oh, the natives they do this, they you know they're lazy, all these things, these stereotypes are lazy, they don't work, they're drunk, like so all these things. So they they start to learn that they believe what they hear. The very negative wrong stuff. Yes. Right. And then and then the other thing is, the downtown is where there are a lot of homeless people and there are a lot of natives. So a lot of people they they base natives on the, the few people they see downtown and they just when, when I tell someone I'm native they don't believe me and they're like but you have a job but you're working but you're this but you're that you know everything positive or even you if you're, you're wearing native. a hijab yeah yeah you, <laughs> you can't, can't be, yeah. you don't you can't be native because you, yeah. you're working you're not native you know yeah. so they have a, a total different picture of, you know they stereotype all the natives the same so it I think education is big, you know, um, just like with, I, I don't want to bring this kind of too much, but like with Islam, it's always about educating yourself. Um, so they need to, people, when people just have a, stereo, a, a bad image of Islam, they need to investigate for themselves. And that's the same thing you need to do with First Nations, investigate. Don't just believe what you hear, or if you've seen a few people downtown, that's not... Um, that's not all of us. I think that is excellent advice because, as you know, sadly for us as Muslims, uh, a lot of people have a stereotype about mm -hmm. us and yes. a lot of people judge us from the bad actions and behavior of a few you know, Muslims who behave yeah. in very un-Islamic ways. So that's a very valid point. Uh, Sister Fatima, Aisha, anything? I think um, Orange Shirt Day is a really good start by becoming more aware um, because it, there's a whole day dedicated to it and um, people start asking questions like why are we wearing orange? The kids go back home and say we, um, we learned this at school today and then the parents become more aware. So it's a good start and like um, Sister Khadija said, um, education. And once you get those facts, um, it, uh, she said lots of immigrants, they don't know who First Nations people are. Um, so once you get those facts, like t tell people about it. Tell, go back home, go back, um, when you go back to visit your country, uh, tell people about First Nations people because um, 
going to different countries, for example, um, I've been to Saudi Arabia, I've been to Morocco, they have no idea who First Nations people are in Canada. If they ask me, um, where are you from, and I say I'm from Canada, they're automatically thinking, like, why am I not Caucasian? Mm -hmm. And, oh, maybe I look more Arab. So they, they don't have an idea about uh, First Nations people. I've asked people in Morocco, um, I've told people in Morocco that I'm Canadian and they say, um, like in Morocco all they know is Quebec and right. um, Quebec French. is French and the, it's Caucasian people, a lot of Caucasian people here. So um, they don't know the original people in, in Canada. So just if you can get the facts about um, the First Nations, Métis, Inuit people, mm -hmm. then go to your country and, and tell people about them so they can know who we are. Is that any, uh, any advice as to how uh, you know, people can become more aware of the First Nations people and the community? Um, well, I actually think it would be for our community to, um, like, you know, try to, um, come together and, um, educate people about it, you know, um, like, welcome more people into our, um, like into our reserves and right. into like so people go and visit and see for themselves yeah like um you know like my uh my grandmother like my cookum um because of what the trauma that they've been through in uh residential school um because majority of the well all of the nuns and priests in there were caucasian mm -hmm. so um, growing up, they're so traumatized. Sometimes, they um, they would rather just stick like to their like a really tight knit community mm -hmm. of native people. So I think if the elders also were to um, open up a little more and then welcome people and the welcome outside. much more people. I suppose at the end of the day. Um, as Muslims, we are reminded in the in our holy uh, book, the Quran. You know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us that He has made us into nations and tribes, so that we may know one another. And uh, so, inshallah, we we make du'a that uh, you know that the peoples of Canada uh, get to know one another, and get to know our First Nations, and the First Nations get to know uh, <coughs> new Canadians and other Canadians as well. So, at the end of the day, it's it's all about uh, knowing one another, mm -hmm. and the more we know of each other, then you know the uh, the better we treat each other, and the more we respect each other, and all that we bring to humanity, inshallah. Yeah, it, it, it growing up, like also as I was saying, I went to a school. I um, I lived on a reserve, and our school, the white school, was seven minutes away. So some of the natives went to that. So all we ever knew was the white and the native kids. Never, I never knew any other color person. And as I got older, I was shocked when I first seen, you know, someone of color. But this, the, God created us for, you know, to know each other. That's right. And, and when I, when I first became, when I first started, um, when I first traveled overseas to Morocco 13, 14 years ago, uh, that was my, an eye-opener to me because I was very small-minded mm -hmm. before that. And I, probably, I think people need to travel because that's they don't understand or oh, visit each other yeah, yeah. <laughs> or visit each other's communities yeah. right which is like traveling yeah yeah so right. for me that was a beautiful experience that to go because that changed my whole life that that's trip right. changed my whole life and it, it opened my eyes and it opened doors to a whole different life a beautiful you know beautiful life and people need to um do do that as well like they need to Get out of our boxes and absolutely get to know each other. I always say, and that's how get you know to each know each the world, world. Get to know the world. Your own community. Absolutely, yeah. get to know the world. Yeah. I think that's the best. So, Jazakumullah um, Khair, thank you so much. Uh, may Allah reward all of you for coming this afternoon and sharing your 
uh, thoughts and feelings. Again, Orange Shirt Day is coming up and at Al Mustafa School we are going to be observing it. Any final words for the, the boys and girls and the staff and even the community about Orange Shirt Day or, you know, anything, any other important message that you would like to pass on, please? Guys. Um, <laughs> oh, so thank you for per participating and uh, we really hope that um, every year, even if you're you not know, at the school next year, maybe you're graduating, just pass on this tradition with your family and um, continue to observe Orange Shirt Day in the future. Yes. Um, I really think that we should embrace it, um, not just as a com Native community, but as like the entire um, population of Canada, even the world, you know, <laughs> because um, each and every one of the countries in the world, we all have our thing that we suffer with. We all have um, our hardships and I think we should all come together as a world and support each other. So Jazakumullah Khair, thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, we will be observing Orange Shirt Day uh, this coming Wednesday and uh, inshallah a lot to learn, uh, a lot more to learn and may Allah SWT give us the strength and the tawfiq to continue in this journey of the communities, all communities getting to know one another. Jazakumullah Khair on behalf of the Al Mustafa Academy, uh, my name is Ibrahim Duma, the principal and uh, thank you for joining us in this discussion. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.